Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining this week's GitLab University. This session um, is going to be led by John. John, thank you. Um, he'll be talking about how operations teams use GitLab to manage infrastructure uh, code. So I am going to hand it over to John. John, I don't know if you want to present um, the slides from your screen. Awesome. Um, and just a reminder for everyone, uh, these sessions are meant to be collaborative. So feel free to interrupt with questions um, and we'll just, we'll pause and answer them and keep going. Awesome. So can everybody see the slide deck? Uh, so we can see, it looks like you might have, I don't know how many screens you have, but we can see like three screens right now. Oh, wow. Mm. Mm -hmm. Let's just do this then. We've also got a direct link to the slides in uh, Drive, John, so we can always use that if you can't figure that out. Yep, that's true. Yep, let me just uh, change to do this and then drop out of this and just go to that. How's that? That worked. So the agenda that we've got set up for today is a multifold agenda. So we're going to look at definition of infrastructure as code. We're going to talk about how production engineers and what the responsibilities are and explore how we're using GitLab for those responsibilities. We're going to talk about production engineers workflow and how they use GitLab in, the, in their actual day to day responsibilities. We're going to talk about alternative solutions for production engineers. So what are you doing if you're not using GitLab? And then we're also going to talk about the benefits of production engineers using GitLab um, in their day-to-day -day jobs and workflow. So infrastructure is code. What is that? That's a term that we hear a lot these days. It's one of the common buzzwords. And the classical definition um, is the process of managing and provisioning compute resources, whether it be process, bare metal, servers, or virtual servers, and their configuration through machine parsable definition files, rather than physical hardware configuration and the use of interactive configuration tools. Um, that's an awesome wordy thing, but really what does that mean? So what that means is in most small shops and in the way that we came up doing things, the common way to do things was when you got a server, you rack the server or you bought that server from an online resource, and then you went through and you pointed and clicked on some menu options and you typed some commands in and you configured the server. That server got configured, but it was configured as a one-off, right? So you weren't, there was no way to guarantee that you were building the 35th server the exact same way as you built the first server. The only way you could guarantee that is if you had the same person doing it and they were kind of following a run book. Clearly that doesn't scale. So then when you begin to start scaling up your enterprise, you end up with lots of little special snowflakes. So servers that don't match the configuration that have slightly different things here and there. As a means to kind of get our head around this, we as an industry said, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so for that, what we started doing was, let's look at the infrastructure the same way that software developers and the rest of the people look at solving that problem. And what if we treat this as code? So what does that mean? So when we talk about infrastructure as code, we start by saying there's one system. There's not a collection of systems. So when we look at our landscape, we want to see everything and treat it as a holistic system. So for us, what that means is like when we're running GitLab, is that GitLab itself is a system. It's not just front-end servers and or database servers or servers that process mail. The whole thing is a system in and of itself. The next thing is the desired state of the system should be a known quantity. And by this, what we mean is we should have an idea of what we want to be performing and executing in a production role. And we should be able to describe that in such a fact that we can actually put it in, in a text file, put it in a configuration so that we know where we want to be. 
This is the key part of this whole thing is where we begin to like tie all of our edges together. The known quantity should be machine parsable. That's the really cool part. So by that, what we mean is we know how we want to treat the system. It's one thing. We know what the state of the system should be. And then we need to be able to have that be read by a machine so that a computer can understand what should the end state of all of our servers and infrastructure be. To kind of add on to that, then we then say the actual state of the system should self-correct to the desired state. So there's tools to help us do this. We at GitLab use a tool called Chef. And what Chef allows us to do as systems engineers and, and production engineers is say, this is my system. The desired state of the system should be X. And we write some actual code to say, we need to have so many servers and the servers should be running web servers and this and that. That code is then parsed by the Chef server. And then it actually runs in our environment to make and autocorrect the environment to make sure it's in that state. So if somebody goes and changes something, like logs into a server and makes a change, every 30 minutes, we're gonna go around behind it and clean it back up to make sure that we always know what the exact state of our environment is in. And then the last point of this is that the only authoritative source for the actual state of the system is the system. So what we mean by that is the system is continually updating itself with the current state that it's in. So if we've got five servers, we've got a file that builds a system that says we've got five servers. If it's six, it's six. And that is the, the, the source of authority for it. It's not in an external run book. It's not in an offline document. It's inherent to the system and the way that we're managing the system. Anybody have any questions about that? That's kind of a lot to like chew off. All right. So, oh, yeah. The, the unwritten rule there is that the entire system must be deployable using source media and text files. So we do this with Chef, and we do this with Chef using off-the-shelf products um, and deployables. So I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but um, GitLab.com, the enterprise service that we run for the community as a software as a service, that's actually deployed using the same uh, GitLab Enterprise Omnibus builds that we give our customers to deploy. So we're totally doing the same thing that they would do using industry best practices to deploy that and scale it and manage it. Um, so we, we really like to think of ourselves as we're dog fooding in that effect. Um, and we're doing the exact same things that our customers would be doing when deploying our software. So we as production engineers, operations engineers, kind of have some guiding principles that take us down that path as infrastructure as code. One of them is keep the components in the infrastructure simple so that they'll be better understood. Sid says it a lot, boring solutions are the solutions that we implement. This follows through with how we do implementations in terms of engineers. The simple solutions are the solutions that you want because they let your environment be easily understood by all the engineers that are working with you. The second thing is use small tools to interoperate well versus overly complex, all singing, all dancing, whirly gigs. I gotta admit, it's very tempting in this industry to pick the all singing, all dancing thing that, that you know, does all the things. The problem with those is that they do all the things just not quite well. So we want small tools that do jobs really well. The third is, <laughs> so we're, as, as software engineers and, and DevOps guys, we're writing code. We're writing code that affects the infrastructure. And one of the key principles of that is, do not author any code that you would not buy. And that's a really big one because sometimes, you you know, I'm guilty of it, we're all guilty of it. You come into a place and you kind of patch something together and say, well, this will do for now. Um, and we really try to operate with the, the maintenance of, if you wouldn't pay somebody to write that code for you, don't write that code yourself. And the last one is just a general thing. 
keep the disparity in your architecture to a minimum. So what we mean by this is, so like in GitLab.com, all of our servers are running the same version of Ubuntu. All of them have the same base image set. All of them start from the same place. We don't have different class type servers for different components in terms of their operating system or their architecture. Um, we just make differences in terms of RAM and memory. That way, there's no guesswork when it comes to what is our infrastructure, how does it behave, and how are we managing it? Now, here's where we start getting into the cool part. So what do we do? And then how are we doing it with GitLab? So first of all, we're the on-call guys. So when the site goes down, we're the guys who pick up the fire buckets and like put the hats on and like go to work. Next, we improve, improve the performance and availability. And availability. So for us, this is GitLab.com. For other production engineers, it's typically their site, their product, their SaaS that they're selling. These are the guys that are making sure that their site is running the fastest, the most reliable, and that they're improving the way that it's, it's, it's doing so. We're doing incident response. So anytime somebody calls and says, hey, this is broken, it doesn't work right, I have a problem with this, that's what production engineers are doing. So in our thing, we have the ethos of we make the GitLab product easier for administrators all over the world. So as production engineers for GitLab, we have the unique responsibility in not only keeping the thing up and running, but because we're dog fooding and because we're installing our product um, in our own environment and scaling it, we also have a feedback loop to make sure that we're providing feedback into this build process for our product to make sure that we're making it easier for other administrators to install our product. So if in the process of like when we're doing releases, we see something that doesn't work right or it, it takes a long time, it doesn't give you an error message, it's on us to give the feedback to say, well, we need to kind of shape this up because other administrators installing our product, this is going to be really difficult for them. We're responsible for managing and scaling the infrastructure. Um, with our own infrastructure right now, we're experiencing a pretty awesome growth period. I don't know if we've shared this with you or if you've caught it at the last, uh, I think Pablo shared it at the last um, uh, infrastructure update, but GitLab.com and its usage is growing by one terabyte of data a week. So that's one terabyte of new committed projects that we're growing per week. That's a pretty awesome growth rate. And then we improve the deployment process. This kind of goes hand in hand with the make GitLab product easier for administrators all over the world. So every time we go to deploy the product, we're looking for ways that we can improve that, make it clear, make it more seamless. Um, and this is true for other production engineers in whatever product they're doing. So we're doing this with GitLab. Other production engineers are improving their deployment process every time they go to deploy with their product. How do we do this with GitLab? So there's a really key point that we're driving home with this, which is we're a remote first company. So when you take remote first and you add to that the fact that we have a global team, what that really means is if there isn't an issue describing the problem, the work to be done or the feature requested, it doesn't exist. And that's one of the key features that we really find helpful about using GitLab as a, as a production engineering team is that this is the lifeblood by which we do our job. So how do we use GitLab to keep the lights on? First of all, we use it for all the project definitions and scopes. So by that, we have project scope, projects for infrastructure, performance enhancements for our cookbooks that we use to manage the environment. Every kind of scope that we can actually have a definable um, piece around we've got projects in GitLab for that. Within those, we use it to track work, requests, and problems. So any kind of new work that comes in for us to actually do. So add another server, we've got a new employee being hired, something's broken and it's not working right. We use issues to track all that. We use issues to not only track that, but also to communicate with each other about the status of how that's going down within our global team around the world. We use Git for versioning and tracking of code and docs. So back to the point of infrastructure as code, we're clearly writing a lot of code and we're using that code to manage our infrastructure. We use Git for versioning that. So we're committing our, our custom code that we're writing back to a repository. So 
a lot of this is, is, is what we call our cookbooks. And that's just custom software that we've got that helps us run and manage the environment. But we also have documents. So in much the same way as um, people do document revision for wikis and stuff like that, we have a lot of documents that we take for how we run the site, how we troubleshoot problems. And those are all Git versioned as well. And those are all committed and checked in. Because we're using Git versioning for all of our internal code and our docs, we leverage using GitLab's merge request for collaboration. And this really becomes where you can actually see a lot of our interaction with each other. Because what ends up happening is we submit merge requests based upon um, commit of new code and a commit of new documentation. And then we open it up for both peer review and um, commentary. So that's when you get a lot of your best feedback from your peers about, I, I understand what you're doing, or I don't understand what you're doing, or have you thought about solving this problem this way? There's a, there's a lot of interactivity that takes place in those merge requests for us in terms of managing our environment and, and producing a better product. One of the really cool things that we're also taking advantage of is pipelines for CI testing. So with the tools that we use to run our infrastructure, we have the ability to run tests on those um, independent of actually executing them in the production environment. This is huge for us and it's huge for software and, and, and production engineers everywhere because this allows them to actually take this code that they've written to manage their environment and have it execute in a place where the tests are being run. Ah. Yeah, the yeah, pipelines. Sorry, guys. Ah. Get distracted. Um, so, yeah, run the tests in, in environments where they can see what the outcome is. So for us, we use Chef, and, and Chef has a test suite called Test Kitchen. This allows us to take the things that we're, we're going to be doing in production and run them automatically just by writing our code that says, here's how we want to change the environment. We check the code in, and then automatically our pipeline checks that code out, runs it in a test kitchen, and lets us know in the actual, like, in our GitLab product, whether or not that test passed or failed. If it failed, that means we've clearly got some work to do. We didn't pass some things or there was some poor assumptions being made. And we go back and refactor our code. This lets us totally handle that in a, in a process outside of affecting anybody else's workflow. So we're not affecting dev or stage or any other environment by potentially deploying things that would be um, adverse to our environment because we're running tests with them in, a, in an isolated test environment for our, our uh, configuration management. So the operational engineer's workflow. This is really going to just mimic what we've talked about before, but on a day-to-day -day basis, what ends up happening is here's our circle of life. So we open an issue. We're opening issues all the time. When we open the issue, we define the problem, or we identify the scope of the feature, or we identify the requested change. Once we've got that nailed down in the issue, we start working the problem. Working the problem comes in many different forms for the production engineer. Um, but one of the first things that you have to start doing is making sure that you're committed to making frequent comments in the issues as you progress. We use this all the time, and it's, it's very handy for us because, again, having the remote workforce and being totally asynchronous with our communication, it's handy to go back and look at the actual frequent comments in the issue to see where it was being worked, where somebody left off, what their comments were about it. And it provides you a, a depth of scope and understanding for what the, what's happening in the issue. We also do use call outs and cross mentions. So anytime we're in an issue and we need some help from somebody else, we use at mention call outs to bring them into the issue. And then if we've actually got an issue that relates to a larger issue or to something else that's happening, we cross mention those issues in our tickets to, talk, to, to bring um, full functionality in terms of this might be something that's happening in a deployment cycle, but this affects an actual aspect of the product that we're trying to ship. So we'll cross mention those and just call in the other teams to help us work it. We commit the code document and design. This is one of the most fundamental concepts to the actual, like, not only engineer's workflow, but the GitLab workflow. So we want to 
open an issue, start working the problem. And as soon as we've got something to commit, we want to commit early and commit often. So as soon as we've got our fleshed out idea of how we're solving the problem, be it a document to document, say this is the procedure we're going to start following, or here's my design for this new function that we're adding, or here's my code that I'm writing to help um, implement this feature or correct this production set, we commit it. And as soon as we commit it, that then lets us start running tests for validation. So we start validating on it, we start getting feedback on it immediately, and then we open the merge request. And in that merge request, that's when we start getting feedback and review from peers. So it's really awesome because we can start getting immediate feedback from our tests if we're actually doing some production changes where we're doing CI on that. And then we also open the merge so we can get cross-functional feedback, so our peers and our reviews. Um, this is also where we actually get guidance for work in progress, right? So there are some times where we'll open a merge request the moment we commit the first piece of code. We're not ready to actually make the merge yet, but we want to bring people in and say, here's what I'm working on, and here's what I've got stubbed out, and I like your input going forward on the guidance for how to solve this problem. And using the merge request as a good place for that to have a discussion is where we identify it as a work in progress and, and bring in collaboration to, to solve that problem. And then we close the issue. And then the rest is just wash, rinse, repeat. So Mara asked for alternative solutions. So this is what I call the mixed bag of pain. So the worst case scenario, if you're a production engineer and you're not using the tools like we have available to us in GitLab, that typically means you have no version control. So you're not actually versioning from one solution to the next, what you actually did to make it work, what you've corrected to make it work better for you. You can't actually move backwards or forwards in time to say, I fixed this and it made it better, or I made this change and it made it worse, but I don't know what I changed where. You've also got no central place for working issues. That's one of the big things that we utilize, and that's something that, that if you don't have this, it really makes life hard for you. There's also no review for collaboration and cycle process, and there's no automated testing. That's your worst case scenario. And unfortunately, that's a lot of production engineering shops, right? What ends up happening is software development has a lot of cool toys and tools, and then the actual production engineers get kind of left behind in the environment and, and either aren't brought on board to take advantage of those tools or are never actually trained up on how to use those tools. So the environments either don't have it or they aren't including software, uh, uh, aren't including production engineering in how to use those tools. Slightly better um, is a cobbled together system that works mostly. And this is this is typically what you would see in the field, right? So you're at a company and there are loosely joined and disjointed systems. So they might have a help desk to track requests and the software development team might have Jira that they're using to actually track some um, project functions and build cycles. And maybe there's a Jenkins server that somebody's using to do automated, you know, continuous integration and deployment, but they probably haven't told the production engineering team how to use it um, or they don't have rights to. And things work for the most part, but they're highly siloed and there's no actual integration between all that. And maybe you're doing testing, but more than likely you're not. So then that leads into the, the major hey, John. Yeah. So just a question back on the other slide around alternative solutions. I'm curious, yep. like, it seems like, I mean, you sort of walked us through like why infrastructure as code is important and how we at GitLab are, are using this to really enable a better process for all of our production engineers and sort of all of us as, as a company. And yep. so I'm kind of curious as to the use case that you mentioned around worst case scenario, why, why would, why would the production engineers be sort of treated separately than the software developers, especially given the fact that um, I mean, the infrastructure needs to hold to support all software development. And so I'm, I'm curious as to why you feel these silos exist and what your thoughts are on like how they're, they're being broken down and why infrastructure as code is becoming a larger trend. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's actually really interesting. So um, in most, and this is sadly, in, in most well-defined large corporate workshops, what you find is walled gardens, right? So the team that's responsible for maintaining the environment, making it run, making it go, and making it performant is generally a 
wholly separate team with different management structures and goals and, and resources than the software development engineering team that's providing the product software that the company are, is either selling as a service or distributing or, or producing, right? And so typically what you then see happen is the uh, lobbying over the walls of, you know, I wrote the software, we kicked it out, now it goes deploy this and make it run. And how you make it run, how you make it work is kind of two separate camps on that, right? We're beginning to see a lot of that. I mean, the the merge back of this became um, big a couple of years ago with the concept of, of DevOps, where you had the blending of, yeah, so let's get some people that actually know how to write code that are also engineers that can kind of straddle this fence and like, let's start collaborating in a shared space because it is a shared problem and it's not just something you can toss over the fence. Unfortunately, you still see a lot of this today. And, and you see a lot of this today also because the concept of treating your infrastructure as code, if you're not coming at it from a greenfield environment, which means your environment's brand new and you've to just totally been able to make all these changes from the get-go, a brownfield implementation where you're trying to take your existing legacy stuff and port it this way, it becomes difficult. But what's funny is it's difficult, but that's all the more reason why you need something like this to help you get there, right? You need something where you converge and control your software that you're writing to help you get from point A to point B and where you can have a central place to track your issues, work, and testing that they're all tied together in the feedback process. Um, so that's the worst case. And, and, and unfortunately, we kind of see that a lot. Um, the, slightly, the slightly better is what you see in most mid to large tier companies, right? So they've got a smattering of different products and maybe they made them integrate together but they largely aren't. They're, they're integrated in, in Surface only. Um, and by that, IT presents them as a unified front and makes it look seamless to the business or to the outside you know, consumer. But internally, um, there's not a lot of tie back reporting or integration in those products, right? Um, and typically what you see is you see a SharePoint website front end for some reporting and spreadsheets on, you know, projects and things like that and you see jenkins servers for ci and build and you see um you know maybe some jira or something for um workflow and and um, development life cycle so that's that's kind of the state of the alternate path of these things um and where where we make a difference and i feel and, and this is what kind of I advocate to people when we talk about this is the, you know, did someone say bacon? So what we gain out of having GitLab is we've got a clear start to finish visibility with the entire team. So whether it be from the first code commit all the way down to the deployment of the thing that we're using, there's visibility with the entire team of the entire process. I know when the code commit happened. I know when the commentary happened. I know what the issue status was. I know whether the build failed or didn't fail. And I know what the, the actual next action steps were. And that's all inside a single pane with us. We do full versioning of the code and that makes the company function, right? By that, I mean, at every point of our process in, in developing infrastructure as code, we're committing it back and we can look at when we did the right thing, when we did the wrong thing and reiterate on that to help make a better product and continuously develop to get better and better and better. We have peer review and commenting. The fact that you can take your work, put it into a system and say, now there's an easy way for you to go look at what I did, make a comment on it and give me instant feedback on what I'm trying to do that that really is priceless for us. I mean, we use this every day. We used it, I mean, just this morning and yesterday afternoon, we have a, a junior engineer who's coming up to speed. He's learning how to um, write some Ruby code. He's learning how to use Ruby to automate our environment. This has been the perfect environment for him to learn this because he, he can go off on his own and do some review, write some code and commit it and then in his merge request say, here's what I've done. Um, what do you think about this? And then get pointers and feedback 
to make him a better engineer and a better developer in the process. And then I can't stress this enough, the automated testing for coverage. This is so important because what this allows us to do is step in it a whole lot less. And as production engineers, you know, there's a there's an old watchword which is you can do a thousand things right and you will only be remembered for the last thing you do wrong. And that is totally true for, for, for production engineering. You can keep the site up all month long. Everyone will remember the 30 minutes of outage that you had because you didn't test something correctly or because you just went ahead and shoved it in without making sure that it actually passed validation. So the fact that we can actually use this our, our, our own software to do testing and code coverage to say, yep, I tested this. I know for a fact that this is going to deploy correctly. And so that when I roll this into production, I have very high confidence this will do what it's supposed to do. And then so there's yeah, the finish up. It's all under one system that just works, right? I mean, the beauty of our installation path, and, and the only reason why I know this is because we dog food with it, is that it comes as one installable. It's one file that you execute and run. And we can take you from running one file in one execution path to being fully compliant with committing, commentary, CI, and deployment. So that this really helps us um, as production engineers make our lives innumerably easier in terms of delivering a better product, becoming better engineers, um, and helping to take a company to the next level in terms of growth and scaling. And that's all I got on production engineering with GitLab. Anybody have any questions or comments or freeform discussion? I have one. Yep. I'm I'm curious about um because I think one of the things that's beneficial is the fact that, you know, all of us at GitLab sort of we work within all of the same projects. So if I think about um, you know, when I have when I have a question or something like that, people will point me to an issue and it doesn't matter what issue that project is in, I'm able to see it and see like mm -hmm. what conversation is already happening. So I'm curious from your perspective, in an ideal world, what's the connection of like the production engineering team to software developers and how do we think about the benefits of teams all working within one one platform or project, whatever it may be? to sort of allow the feedback loop to even go outside the production engineering team. No, absolutely, and there's immense value in that. And so we experienced that today. So we are all part of the, the GitLab development group. So um, I have access to view and see all of the actual software engineering and, and, and tasks between the EE and CE products, as well as the, um, the one-off things that we use to like run GitLab. So even the products for developing the customer um, like the customer website and things like that. That's really valuable because it, it allows a total feedback loop. Um, there have been, and, and it flows both ways, right? Software engineers have, have um, developers have opened up issues and said, hey, um, I'm doing this and I have a question about if I do this, what will the impact of that be out in production? Right, as well as the feedback of, you know, there. I mean, just recently there was an issue where it's like, okay, so I see you've developed this feature, but in terms of how we roll this to production, could we change the way this function works because it it, it will scale better if we do it this way, right? So that is really valuable to us, and and that level of cross collaboration is something that I would encourage companies to open up and do rather than be more siloed with their information. Any other questions from others on the call? Yeah, hey, good morning, uh, John. It's Hayden here. Um, th thanks again for your time this morning, mate. It was really valuable. Um, how do production teams leverage Docker, uh, if if at all? Um, yeah, so I'm wondering how you know, our love <coughs> of Docker can be a competitive advantage for uh, production teams. 
Right. So actually, good point, Hayden. And uh, I, I completely glossed over that. So um, one of the things I should have said is that in that testing that we're doing, so when we actually launch a test to test how our actual product's going to perform in, in our environment, we're leveraging Docker. We're leveraging our Docker registry and we're leveraging the Docker functionality of our CI runners and our product. So what ends up happening is um, we run GitLab on Ubuntu 16.04. Okay, so when we make a change to how we're going to manage the production environment, the first thing that happens is we kick off a Docker image, we, we kick off a CI pipeline that goes and gets a 1604 image. It applies the latest set of, of um, our environment standards to it, and then it begins to run our recipe against it to let us know how it's going to perform in our environment. So we're actually testing for our environment with Docker images that model our environment um, in, in real time. So it, it plays a huge role. Um, going forward, it, it plays an even inter more interesting role in terms of we're now supporting um, the ability to create artifacts from our product space and then take those Docker images, create new Docker images, and then leverage those Docker images in our repository for deployment process. Right. So um, we're not currently uh, leveraging Docker as a deployment mechanism, but there are shops uh, today that use Docker as the means for actually deploying IT services and products, right? And so what this means for them is as a production engineer, you could entirely have a whole pipeline where you made a change to a product that you were supporting and maintaining, committed it, ran a test that passed, generated a new Docker, image or artifact from that, and then to take that based upon whether it passed or failed and deployed it to your environment, which the fact that you can do that makes an engineer's life so amazingly streamlined that, that it just pales in comparison to doing anything else with a point and click and deploy and, and move. Got it. Um, is there? A, are you able to just give us a little bit of a uh, visual on on some of those things? Like you mentioned having pipelines integrated with the test kitchen, and then just before you mentioned how you're running your chef scripts against a Ubuntu Docker image, is there any visuals you can actually show us what that looks like in GitLab? Or is it? Uh, if it's too... Yeah, I mean, it's not that exciting um, because it just works. It just might be helpful. <laughs> Yeah, it just might be helpful for the sales team to actually kind of see it, you know, what it looks like and have someone like you kind of describe what's happening, you know, on that page or what did happen or what's going to happen. So I think most of the sales team is really familiar with the with the GitLab flow, you know, creating an issue, creating a branch, creating a merge request, you know, closing the loop. But I think the CI C D part is a, for me at least, and maybe I can speak for the rest of the sales team, is a little bit of a gray gray area. Let me just grab a current project that we're working on here. And then So back to sharing my screen. So, uh, okay, no, there we go. Uh, sorry for the busy mess here. Everything out of the way. Um, so what we've got here is we're currently in the process of building a new monitoring uh, environment and system for GitLab. <clears throat> and so what we've got now is we're, we're building this on a product called Prometheus, which was built by SoundCloud. Um, and we're actually writing cookbooks. So the cookbook is the automated means by which we're going to be deploying the software into our environment. So we've started writing a cookbook here for Prometheus. And so in our repository, We've got all of our files that are how we're going to be deploying 
this monitoring package. What we're doing with this is we built a pipeline to check this code out and then run it against the actual test kitchen suite to say, check the code out, check it out in our environment, and then basically run a mock deployment of this code to make sure that it deployed the monitoring software and it was successful. And you can see here, um, we've had failures. And we failed doing this because we had an error in one of our actual cookbooks that was actually gonna start the process. So here we see, we made a commit. The outcome desired of this was to install the monitoring software and start it. This actually failed because the run it service that should be responsible for starting the monitoring software failed to start. So immediately we can see, oh man, this isn't gonna work. This won't, like we can't deploy this to production because it's got a failed issue. We reiterate on that and here we go. Alex made a change to the actual code that we were using to deploy this. We go through the process of deploying it. The run it service starts, the bundle actually executed, so we got our, our build succeed. So we actually checked the code out, deployed our monitoring software, the monitoring software started and executed just like we thought it would. So now this package is good to go. So this is, I mean, this is an example of where we're using our pipelines to test the delivery services that we're using to manage and monitor and control our environment. Like I said, it's not that exciting, but in terms of when you actually see what's happening behind the scenes, it is pretty neat. And so just, just in this simple view right here, we can see that this is the latest commit. So 18 hours ago, we made a change. We tested it. It took two minutes and 57 seconds to actually deploy our software for our monitoring environment, and the test passed. So today, we could take this current version of software and feel very good and confident about deploying it into our production environment. So that's, so that's really cool. So if you're in a legacy system like SVN or something like that without even a, a tool like this, do they have to single-handedly push to a um, post-production uh, deployment and then see what happened? And then if it fails, they have to go back and review all the code and it's not highlighted. It's just a mess, it sounds like. It is. And more often than not, what that means in, 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 in most shops, I mean, I know it's, it was that way in shops that I came from, is when that level of burden is is there it's just simply not being done right and and that's that's a sad truth but it's a hard truth so what ends up happening is if i don't have a system like this and i don't have a means to like make this readily available to me with just i mean all we really did i mean let's let's go back and look at this in order to get this to happen we generated a file that is not in that view. Um, we generated a file for our CI system, and that was it. And then because of that, that allowed us to have this entire workflow and, and process that let us see this. And, and I guess that's my key point. If this tool isn't really available to you, if it's something that you have to jump through hoops for, the path of least resistance is going to get you. You're not going to be doing it. And because you're not going to be doing it, you literally are leaving yourself open to, to failure and risk in your enterprise. Yeah, that makes sense. But um, if there are no other questions, uh, I think we can close out. But I want to make sure that there's no other questions. All right. All right. Thanks, Matt, James, John. Great Thanks, James, John. Thanks, John. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, John. Great presentation. Thanks, yeah, John. John. Have a great day. It was really that helpful. Was great. Thank you. Thanks, John. See you, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mara.